Let's sit on, uh, over on this side or something, or so we can have a little more balance. Or should I? Should I? I don't know where I should sit, but okay. <laughs> Here. I hope you're okay, Iria. Yeah, you're okay? Okay. Do I have enough battery charge? I think I do. <laughs> Well, um, I think we should probably get started here uh, as it's just past our 
uh, time here, and we have a lot to cover. Uh, good morning and welcome to our panel, The Dark Side of Internet Policy, How Flawed Policy Can Lead to Censorship, Surveillance, and Shutdowns. My name is Dominic Ballone from Counterpart International. We're a 52-year-old global development organization operating in 28 countries. Along with Mr. Robert Guerra, who many of you are familiar with um, in this space, along with our program officer, Ms. Marilyn Vernon, we're leading an amazing delegation of legal scholars, media policy experts, and a gender and technology specialists whom you see before me on either side. They come from countries of focus for our program at counterpart, Sri Lanka, Ukraine, Venezuela, and Zimbabwe. On behalf of our Director of Global Programs, Ms. Susanna Grau-Batla, and our Internet Governance and Freedom Program Chief of Party, Danilo Bakovich, thank you for coming this morning. In this session, we'll focus on several major issues from the front lines of civil society activism and legal scholarship. Computer and cyber crimes laws, social media and information manipulation, surveillance, censorship and blocking, threats to women's freedom of expression online in Sri Lanka, and hate speech codes. So we have a big bucket list this morning, uh, but we have a panel that's well up to the task. I won't go uh, into lengthy explanation beyond that. Instead, I'd like our panel to share with you their expertise and stories uh, from their countries and regions. Later, we'll invite you to join what we hope will be a spirited discussion. And Robert will be monitoring online traffic, so those out in cyberspace who wish to join us, we welcome your participation as well. Um, I'll quickly go around to our uh, panelists to give a brief um, introduction. First to my right, we have Ms. Iria Puyosa, um, a Venezuelan um, academic and social media researcher uh, based in Quito, Ecuador. Uh, she's conducted extensive research and work on social media manipulation, propaganda, and network disruptions in Latin America. Uh, Vitali Moroz, to my left, is head of the new media division at Internews Ukraine, uh, one of that country's leading media and policy NGO advocacy organizations. Um, Andri Pavziuk is vice president of the Ukrainian Academy of Cybersecurity. Uh, he's also a noted legal scholar um, and a Fulbright fellow in Washington, D.C. He also brings with him a sharp prosecutorial mind. Uh, Nalika Ganawadane is a journalist, scholar, and a leading analyst on social and cultural and political impacts of information and communication technologies in Sri Lanka and South Asia, and he's also a self-described one-man troublemaking machine. Uh, please forgive uh, Nalika. He's been suffering from a terrible flu this week, and he's losing his voice. Um, but his, his intellect and his um, scholarship does not fail him. So we are uh, pleased to have him. He spent yesterday in the hotel, so uh, please be gentle on him. Um, Sachini Pereira is a feminist activist from Sri Lanka, to my left here, who works at the intersection of uh, women's human rights and technology. She is currently doing research on technology-related violence against women in Sri Lanka and developing a digital tool to build an evidence base to challenge impunity around this issue. And finally, to my left, we have Mr. Um, Ernest Mudzengi. He's a first-time um, IGF uh, participant. He's new to this space. He's the director of the Media Center of Zimbabwe. They're also a partner of Counterpart Internationals, um, which is an information and web Resource Center for Freelance Journalists, Citizen, and Civic Activists. Uh, their work is largely focused on capacitating marginalized communities to report on issues that are generally um, sidelined by the mainstream media there. Um, and so I want to go to um, Ernest first. Um, we've had a number of bilateral meetings um, 
with our delegation and Ernest has, has had a very compelling story about the situation um, in his country. Um, as some of you know, uh, that country has recently gone through what some have charitably described as a military assisted transition. And so, and so what I'd like to ask you, uh, Ernest, is can you give us some more context for what is happening in the country with regard to freedom of expression and how that's led to the, the uh, cyber crimes and cyber security um, bill and the government's continued criticism of social media activism. And, and so now we have a new administration um, in the form of Mr. Menengagwa, and I want you to uh, answer if we should be optimistic or hopeful about that new administration. Oh, okay, thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Dominic, uh, and uh, welcome, uh, colleagues, comrades, and friends. Maybe to start off with this question, I think it uh, takes us into the political and socioeconomic context in Zimbabwe, where we have a, a new president, a new president who all along has been a, a lieutenant of the now uh, retired president, a president who was forced into retirement. So to answer his question directly, I think we can only talk of uh, cautious and calculated optimism because uh, what we are having is essentially the very old system that has been there. We have only had the change in terms of faces. The name of the political party in power remains the same. The superstructure of the political system remains the same. So we can only talk of uh, cautious optimism. And uh, as we speak to this cautious optimism, we must bear in mind that uh, unless it was uh, President Robert Mugabe who was solely responsible for violation of uh, free expression, uh, violation of freedom of the media, and the blockage of uh, people's right to access to information, we can be very happy. But if he was not the only one responsible, then uh, there is reason uh, to be cautious. There is a reason to look at this carefully. I know that people celebrated uh, the world over when uh, former President Mugabe resigned. But obviously, the celebration could be justified on the basis that he was the only president that is Zimbabweans he had known for the past 37 years. But uh, when we look at the system, we have to look at it carefully. He granted uh, President Munangagwa has taken over. He has spoken to issues of economic liberalization. He has uh, spoken to issues of uh, the voice of the people being the voice of God, and so on and so forth. Those are very good words to hear. But when you look at the system, when we look at uh, free expression, and in particular, when we look at internet governance, we haven't seen much in terms of change. In fact, uh, the bill that is known as the cyber security and the computer crimes bill remains in place. And there is intention to make sure that it is enacted into law before the elections, which are expected any time uh, before September next year. So the bill is there. And the man, the minister who originally superintended the promulgation, the authoring of the bill, is still the minister. At one point, President Mugabe he had created a separate ministry uh, to be responsible for cyber security, uh, cyber threat detection, and countering uh, activities. But now, the ministry has been returned back. It, it has been dissolved, and the functions have been re returned 
to the same old Ministry of ICT, that is the Information Communication Technology and the Cyber Security. So we still expect the bill, which is going to be very, uh, which is going to be injurious to digital rights as we know them, to be enacted before the elections. So for that reason, I think we may as well not largely celebrate. As civil society, we are trying to contribute to the bill to make sure that when it is eventually enacted, at least it can have some modicum of democratic provisions. But we see, we don't see much of that happening. We can only uh, pray, but uh, the intentions of the government as we see it uh, are to make sure that it retains, con retains control of the information sphere. In fact, uh, the government has been known to issue threats against uh, cyber democracy. People simply expressing themselves through the cyberspace have been exposed to threats. For example, someone simply through WhatsApp points out that the bread of the price of bread has gone up. They say you have become a threat to national security for simply pointing out that uh, prices have gone up, and for simply taking photographs of uh, prices changing in the shops, you have become a national threat to national security. And I think this brings us to the issue of uh, cyber security uh, being defined as state security, as politicians' security, as opposed to the security of the individual citizen as they use the internet. Then uh, the issue of uh, police, when you look at this uh, policy formulation, the dark side of flawed police, one of the fundamental tenets of flawed police is non-people participation. You have policies that are imposed from above, policies that lack citizen input, and these policies are centered at the politicians. They are mainly there to protect the interests of the politicians, and that's the tragedy we are having in Zimbabwe. People have not been able to participate in the making of these policies, and they are now victims of policies that are primarily designed to maintain the status quo. And uh, that's the situation. And uh, for that, we cannot be overly uh, optimistic. Let me not be pessimistic, but mm. let me be cautious in being optimistic. Uh, the situation is not as good. Then uh, when you look at the ordinary citizen who has not been consulted, they, 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 they have problems. Look at issues of access to the internet. We recently carried out a research which point to serious bottlenecks in terms of access. People in the marginalized communities, some of them do not even have phones through which to access the internet. And it brings us to the tragedy in which we are told that we are in a super information highway, but others are outside the Jura halls of that global village. That, that's the other problem. Uh, pertaining to flawed policy. Policy, as uh, I think, should actually accommodate the marginalized citizen to make sure that uh, they are empowered to access the in internet. They are empowered to enjoy digital freedoms. Look, when you look at it, the Zimbabwean constitution, it's a reasonably democratic one, guaranteeing free expression, guaranteeing freedom of the media, and guaranteeing the right of access to information. But the implementation part of it is problematic. What we want from the international community is to insist on reforms. Let's not look at faces. Let's not look at who is the president now, who is the, uh, the minister. Let's look at institutional frameworks. And we must focus on institutional frameworks that protect the ordinary citizen institutional frameworks that ensure that the ordinary citizen enjoys his or her rights to communication, free expression, freedom of the media, and the right of access to information. And as we see it right now, it's a mere change of faces. These rights are still being denied. They are being denied through policies 
that are primarily centered on elites. When you look at it also, there is the business side to it. The government, the new one, the new president, is speaking of being business friendly. But we are saying that if he is to be friendly to business, he should also be friendly to, be, to human rights. Because business, you look at the telecoms, they have not been very good boys in terms of also guaranteeing citizenship rights. To, to, the, 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 we, we have Econet in Zimbabwe, uh, really they have been monopolistic. The, 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 the data prices are too high for the common man. It's very difficult to access internet. In fact, when you talk of prices of data, the government owned uh, telecommunications company is better than the privately owned one, which unfortunately is the highest subscriber base. So business uh, and business alone should not be the case. It should be business and human rights as well. When we talk of free market, it should not only be free market for business, but it should also be free market for politics. We are heading for an election in 2018, and what the people expect is a free market of ideas, of political ideas. Let the people be allowed to access information. Let the people be allowed to freely choose their leader. Let the people not be manipulated. Already people have been manipulated. They were taken to the street to actually celebrate what he has imagined as a coup. Unfortunately, some of our friends uh, they have called it a military assisted transition. But uh, it is basically a coup and could be a very bad president. And people have celebrated that. And uh, what we now want is to insist on reforms, reforms that can make the internet accessible to the public so that they can be able to monitor political processes and so on and so forth. Otherwise, I thank you. Ernest, thank you very, thank you very much, and you can see why we let off with him this morning. Um, we want to turn our focus now to Ukraine and to our friend Andrew here. Um, Andrei, um, your, your country is engaged in, in what people are calling a hybrid war, both in the traditional bombs and bullets and also cyberspace. Um, it's raised a lot of questions about democratic oversight and, and uh, due process and such in terms of issues around blocking uh, and surveillance. Can you give us your uh, take on the situation? Thank you, Dominique. Um, dear friends and colleagues, um, yeah, Ukraine now in a very uh, problematic situation and commonly known as Ukrainian crisis, but uh, you should know that such crisis caused by annexation of Crimean Peninsula by Russia and ongoing aggression in east of our country. And uh, what our government uh, proposed, um, one of the measures is to block uh, social media, mainly Russian social media, in, uh, in the name of national security. But my concern is that our society is divided at the moment because um, it's a question uh, sometimes raised. Are you patriot or you citizen? Are you for national security or you for democracy? And it's um, sometimes at, polit at political level uh, such reasoning we, we had. And um, unfortunately, uh, increased capacities for surveillance, for blocking, are not balanced with adequate guarantees, with democratic control by civilians or military forces. Um, decisions adopted for, um, for blocking uh, websites uh, adopted without any judicial review, without public uh, discussions, they adopted by National Security Council uh, under closed doors for any input from civil society and businesses. Uh, in Ukraine, we have more than 1,000 internet service providers and um, newly introduced legislation uh, drafts in the parliament uh, will require for them to install black boxes for deep packet inspection and uh, 
other surveillance techniques. So it will dramatically change market, uh, telecom market, because um, such burden on uh, IT business to install equipment for own costs will rise to uh, monopolization and uh, dramatically change access to internet in Ukraine. So um, I think that uh, civil society should play an active role uh, and uh, democratic control, parliamentary control of uh, law enforcement agencies are of great importance. Even in uh, case of war, even in uh, case of crisis, uh, democratic institutions should respect uh, 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 democratic institutions should um, create a base for balancing interests, for proportionate measures, and for respecting human rights um, in time of crisis. Uh, <clears throat> I hope my colleague uh, Vitaly uh, could continue this from civil society perspective. That's a great uh, segue. Thanks, Andre. <laughs> Uh, Vitaly, um, Internews Ukraine has recently done some research on how um, top experts uh, in your country uh, on internet governance are reacting to this uh, hybrid war and some of the measures uh, taken by your government. Can you talk about that dynamic of civil society? Thank you, Dominic. Um, I'll start uh, with Mokaman. Um, all of us use like smartphones. Uh, and ask a question to yourself, what do you need to buy a SIM card in your country? Which personal data you should provide? Uh, I believe that Ukraine still functions in a very liberal framework because in order to get access to mobile operators, you need to show just nothing. You can buy it anonymously and you can buy like 10 SIM cards uh, like from one uh, telecom uh, operator. Uh, within this liberal fr frame framework, um, it doesn't sometimes work like in time of conflicts. Uh, every month, U Ukrainian police registered hundreds of anonymous calls uh, with threatening uh, to explode airports and ra railway stations. Uh, and it is, it, is, it is definitely sabotage uh, from our enemies. Um, and um, there is no any regulations uh, on, on, uh, uh, on telecom. So Ukrainians still enjoy like anonymity in getting access to, to, uh, to uh, operators. Uh, but uh, what, uh, what Andrew uh, told about uh, the regulations of internet, it's really happening in Ukraine. And uh, uh, Ukraine uh, still in the situation when there is no clear st strategy vision from the government uh, what it should do uh, regarding the internet. Because in Ukraine, Internet uh, wasn't uh, in attention of government for years because, uh, as in any country, uh, if you uh, pay significant attention to TV stations and control or influence on uh, TV stations, you form public opinion. That's why um, uh, Ukrainian citizens uh, enjoyed like uh, free internet for years, uh, and uh, due to uh, internet, we had like, like huge protest in 2013, 2014, uh, but now everything changed uh, and uh, internet um, became the topic which is uh, heavily discussed. But the, uh, the lawmakers, uh, the government officials, uh, many of them still uh, see it fr from the security perspective. Uh, because, uh, I mean, not many people are deep in tech. Uh, if, if they are lawmakers, because usually they are public personalities, uh, fewer people uh, are from tech uh, with tech background. Uh, so uh, when when civil society uh, look on uh, like the situation, we're trying to uh, better involve uh, government officials into talks regarding uh, internet regulations. And the surveys which Dominic uh, mentioned, uh, we conducted uh, the, the survey with expert and uh, I've recently seen another expert survey. Uh, and um, uh, the, the majority of experts, on the one hand, they acknowledge that digital rights uh, were violated uh, with the decision uh, uh, to block Russian social networks. 
uh, and websites because it was a kind of economical sanctions against Russian companies operating in Ukraine, and it led to uh, blocking. But on the other hand, the same experts acknowledge that the government has the right to regulate internet in time of conflicts. So here's like, like a kind of ambivalency when um, like two different opinions uh, from the same experts. Uh, and uh, how we can call it? Should we call it uh, as a censorship of Ukrainian internet? I would rather not use this term because Ukraine is still a democratic country and uh, within like uh, international ratings, uh, we are partly free country and we have partly free internet according to Freedom House. Uh, yeah, we have uh, negative tendencies and this is like uh, um, the task for civil society if these negative tendencies uh, will be deepened or not. But I would rather use the term uh, protective measures uh, because it's, uh, it's much more harder to talk about regulations uh, when you have a war in your country. Uh, I acknowledge that it shouldn't be, uh, that we shouldn't like argue that while we have the war in the country, we should regulate and, we, uh, and the government can do whatever like they want. Um, I still believe Ukraine has quite aggressive civil society um, with many media nonprofits and civil society organizations uh, who come together to make a, a common approach towards government uh, policies. Uh, and the next step, um, uh, like within uh, Ukrainian scenario, we'll see if the government w will really um, move forward uh, with uh, uh, pre-trial, uh, pre-court pre um, blocking of the website or not. Uh, and this is like one of the uh, key uh, threats for, for Ukraine. Uh, but I hope that uh, it won't happen uh, because we always highlight that if we argue that we are fighting like with Russian aggression, we, we shouldn't use the Russian methods. And uh, if you know the situation in Russia, you should clearly understand uh, how the situation is deteriorated uh, with functioning Roskomnadzor, uh, which have unlimited functions uh, to uh, block any websites uh, which uh, uh, have requirement for uh, ISPs to install black boxes. And unfortunately, some uh, Ukrainian government officials, uh, they're not smart enough to look on Western practices, but they rather look on the Russian side. So, and they, uh, to fight Russia, they might use Russian methods. Uh, that's why where um, ISPs and civil society should stand up and, you, and unite their uh, efforts uh, to educate like uh, government officials uh, and I see like the goal for, for Ukrainian delegation to bring state officials for the following uh, events to EGF, uh, to see like the broader discourse, to see uh, what a possible solution uh, in time of, con uh, of conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Vitaly. Thank you, Vitaly. Uh, we'd like to turn our focus uh, now to South Asia. And I also want to just quickly thank everyone who's shown up since the introduction, very pleased at the turnout. Um, Nalaka, you've, you've uh, s studied a lot on the, on the uh, civil war, the brutal civil war that uh, lasted for 26 years in your country. You have some interesting um, analysis on how that frames um, internet governance and the emergence of a, a cyber nanny state. Care to elaborate? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dominique. <coughs> As he said at the beginning, my freedom to express is currently restricted by a bug. Yes. So please bear with me. I'll try to be as brief as possible. So Sri Lanka is recovering. Uh, Sri Lanka is trying to regain its democracy. Our democracy and our institutions suffered a double whammy in the last few decades. First, there was a brutal civil war. Uh, an ethnic-driven civil war between 1983 and 19, um, uh, 2009. And then there was an authoritarian government uh, which was in office from 2005 to 2014. In fact, it was that government that ended the civil war uh, at a very high humanitarian cost. They're still trying to agree on the numbers of casualties. Uh, the 
the less tangible but equally damaging impacts were on independence of the judiciary, freedom of expression and media freedoms, and on civil society. During the war years and during the authoritarian regime, everyone in Sri Lanka society was polarized between patriots and traitors, basically who uncritically accepted everything was a patriot, and everybody else who asked inconvenient questions uh, was labeled as traitors. Not just labeled and ridiculed, but often mobs were unleashed on them in both offline and online spaces. It became particularly bad that some activists and journalists had to flee for their lives, uh, and they, they, some of them still live in exile. So this regime was peacefully voted out in early 2015. And we've now had a three-year period almost uh, of national unity government that came in promising to restore democracy, human rights, freedom of expression and media freedoms, and judicial independence. Some progress has indeed been made, but uh, we still see a lot of resistance within the system. There is a suspected deep state that even civilian politicians seem unable to regulate or control that is not accountable to parliament. There is, <coughs> there is still a lot of nationalism that has become entrenched. So these are impeding progress and this is affecting the entirety of polity. Uh, not just internet governance, but that's the bigger picture. And it's in that context that uh, the web is becoming increasingly important for Sri Lankans. By this year, by the middle of this year, one in three of us, or 33% of us, uh, were using internet on a regular basis. We have uh, more than six million out of our 20 million people using Facebook. And the conversations are currently vibrant, irreverent, and very diverse. But this has really irked even the liberal government that came in three years ago. So we see that a narrowing of spaces and a search for ways to regulate and control content. Now there are genuine problems as well with the rising number of conversations online in social media, one of which is hate speech. So activists have documented hate speech, uh, targeting ethnic, religious, and sexual minorities, human rights defenders, and others. And these are very real concerns. But at the same time, one has to place these excesses and abuses within the context so as not to use these excesses uh, as a justification for a disproportionately high ways of regulating. So far, the government has not introduced any regulations on social media. However, there have been some very uh, peculiar and worrying statements being uh, published by the telecom regulator of the government uh, in the last few weeks uh, in newspapers. So there was one in uh, uh, about two weeks ago which which uh, I'll just read out one, one part of it. Uh, uh, it. It says, public notice, and uh, making personal defamatory or hate statements using a telecom system or social media or by using SMS or making calls uh, should not be done. And instead, it says, Citizens are urged to use their freedom of speech only for wholesome communications, whatever that means. So this is where I ask the question, do we have a cyber nanny state emerging uh, in the guise of protecting the vulnerable, in the guise of uh, creating a safe and open internet for everyone's use? Are we going to crack down on dissent, crack down on what the authorities consider to be uh, irreverent or inconvenient or unacceptable speech or uh, expressions. So this is where we are. 
And uh, let me just end with uh, a, a remark that really sums up the challenge we face and many societies like Sri Lanka faces. It comes from the Harvard uh, biologist Edward O. Wilson. Goes something like this. We, <coughs> we have within us Stone Age emotions. We have medieval institutions, but in our hands we have godlike technology. Mm. So this mismatch is what we need to recognize, we need to tackle, and so there are challenges of working on digital literacy, strengthening institutions, uh, and rule of law. And that applies to everything online and offline. I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Nalika. And as you mentioned um, on Sunday during our prep for this, uh, if we're all well-behaved girls and boys, what's the point? Um, Sachini, um, I'd like to turn it over to you, given the context of what Nalika just discussed. Can you describe uh, issues surrounding freedom of expression online and women in Sri Lanka? Thank you. Um, so with the context that Nalika set here, so if we are headed to a nanny state in terms of freedom of expression, then you can only imagine how much that would impact women because especially in this post-conflict or post-war Sri Lanka that we are in, women are often looked at as bearers of culture and national identity and a lot of the kind of policing we face on ground uh, it's replicated and sometimes worsened in the online space. So I'm going to talk about some work that I'm doing <coughs> around this. Um, so to begin with, I think when we talk about the internet, um, we talk about it both as a tool that we use to exercise our freedom of expression, but also as an extension of the public space that we occupy, where we live our political and social lives. So the same kind of structural inequalities that we face on ground, um, again, apply in this space as well. And when it comes to women, whether, whether as public figures, like activists or journalists, or just any regular users of the internet, <clears throat> we often see that ex expressing ourselves is co construed immediately in, as gender or sexual expression and attacked on that basis. So, for an example, the study that I'm doing currently around technology-related violence against women and girls in Sri Lanka, a lot of the time we see that the issues are not just around non-consensual sharing of intimate images, but even personal images where you can post any regular picture of yourself and immediately it's framed in a, either a gendered way or a sexual way in a very misogynistic kind of way. And <clears throat> then when we look at the kind of protections that we have around freedom of expression, the Constitution does talk about the right to free speech and publication, um, but there are many restrictions around this, some of which being national security and public morality. So, and when we talk about public morality, we come back to this thing about how women and girls are supposed to be the bearers of culture, and then anything you do kind of, you know, leads to this kind of panic, moral panic, and like, you know, porn panic, that kind of panic. And a lot of the time we see that when it comes to freedom of expression, obscenity is what is being applied as the primary harm or crime as opposed to violation of right to privacy or consent. And a lot of the time law enforcement and the state sees no differentiation between what is consensual and what is non-consensual when women are expressing themselves online. Um, and what we really see then in terms of policy is that there is a lot of incoherence. Um, so some of these archaic laws, like the Obscene Publications Ordinance of 1927, continues to be uh, applied when it comes to freedom of expression online and publication of content online. Um, and this particular act has no definition of obscenity, which means it can be interpreted in all kinds of ways. So we see that when women go through uh, this kind of violence, there is no telling what the law enforcement would apply in certain cases. They cherry pick what they want out of different acts. And 
many countries in the global south and i think what we've heard in the last few days is that these kinds of situations are like similar across our countries and a lot of us are in these like a norm setting phase when it comes to uh, internet and icts and for policy making around it um, but we see a lot of missed opportunities to develop laws and policies with the participation of a lot of different uh, stakeholders um, so around the work I'm doing, uh, some of the dominant narratives we are trying to challenge around technology-related violence, because these are really what is leading to this kind of policy incoherence at the moment, is that um, one of the dominant narratives is that this kind of violence is not widespread and that it's just a, an urban issue. And there is this false dichotomy of online and offline, whereas we see that a lot of the time this kind of a binary is not there and these events, technology affects them in lots of different ways and it's a, it's a spectrum. Um, <coughs> and some of the uh, kind of trends we are seeing out of the work we are doing is that of course it's widespread and of course it happens around the country and uh, it happens to people regardless of um, ethnicity, regardless of sexuality, regardless of religion, lots of different factors. Um, and what we really see is that it happens against a deeper culture of sexism and misogyny. So um, again, if you are trying to apply, let's say, a law like the Computer Crimes Act, which gets done often when it comes to tech-related violence, what happens is you're missing some of these, sorry, can I be heard clearly? Yeah? OK. OK. <laughs> uh, so what happens is um, that um, a lot of the time, women then don't come forward to file cases because the kind of uh, penalties that come with something like a Computer Crimes Act are like prohibitive. And uh, because these acts deal f uh, mainly around financial crime, the kind of penalties are huge. And just like violence that happens on ground, even online violence a lot of the time is perpetrated by people who are known to the survivors. So if it's a family member or if it's someone you are in a relationship with, a lot of the time women say, no, we don't want them to get into trouble. What we want is justice. What we want is this content removed. But we don't want to apply you know, laws like this. So really, one of the main things we are asking for is to look at the existing laws around violence against women and extend them to uh, this kind of um, violence. And um, lastly, so I'll talk about a few of the key recommendations that we have around this. Or, or do you want me to wait? Sure. Yeah, I'll come back to it later. Yeah, thank you. Um, Iria, uh, take us to Latin America, uh, Venezuela specifically. The uh, National Constituent Assembly just passed uh, some hate speech codes. Um, and also, please tie that to your work on social media manipulation in that country and region as well. It's up. Oh, sorry. Uh, Venezuela had been a long time um, trendsetter on restricting uh, online freedom of expression and uh, manipulating public space. So we had in 2009, we already had trolls harassing activists on Twitter. And in 2010, we had box creating artificial trends and uh, artificial conversations to uh, hijack the public conversation on, online. And at least since 2010, at uh, 11, we had a, a, a hacking of the accounts from political parties, opposition political parties, and uh, huge campaigns of uh, disinformation, the, the things later came, came with the fancy name of fake news. It was already uh, all news for us uh, six years ago. So uh, uh, the new trends we are experiencing now in 2017 are the high-speed legislation and biometrics control of borders. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the high speed legislation. As Dominic said, it was passed by the uh, National Constituents Assembly. Uh, this assembly, uh, the legality of these assemblies is uh, already questioned, but especially the, the legality of this law is uh, well under questioning. 
because it's kind of this, the, there is no need for this law. We don't have a history of hate crimes in Venezuela. Uh, we had another kind of the problems, but not that one. And the law is uh, very um, ill-defined. It doesn't define any, anywhere what hate is, 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 and it's pretty much focuses on uh, expressions against government officers. What is going to be penalized is the um, criticizing government officers, uh, uh, the government party, poli pol uh, the government political party. Uh, the law had up to, to 20 years of prison for people expressing opinions who are negative against uh, government officers. And uh, although the law was passed less than two months ago, there are already people being prosecuted uh, on, on, on that grounds. Uh, also, uh, uh, the, the law had some worrisome uh, uh, provisions because they may allow, they may force uh, uh, ICP providers to uh, uh, give the government data about user navigations and uh, user information. Uh, um, besides, uh, um, we are looking at this train being exported to other countries in Latin America. They are already similar laws, a little bit less uh, punitive in other countries in the region, especially countries who are going to have elections next year, like Mexico, uh, Brazil, and Paraguay. They are kind of uh, taking lessons from Venezuela, even those, those are countries a lot more democratic than ours. But they are uh, taking advantage of this new uh, legislation in Venezuela to kind of uh, restrict the, uh, the political debate in their countries in order to uh, facilitate uh, the continuity of their, uh, go, their, their parties on the government. Uh, mm, besides the problem with the hate speech legislation we are experiencing, we think it will uh, affect a, a already negative trend to um, get in prison activists for, for expression. We had people who have been in jail since 2014 just for tweeting jokes against the government. Uh, some of those people are not even activists, they're just random people who happen to uh, say something who was um, negative against some government officer, and they go to jail because of that. Uh, no, no, they, are, they have been three years, and some of them are still in jail. Uh, besides that, we are seeing, uh, looking at an, a new trend on political control in Venezuela. It goes beyond the internet, but involves uh, technological uh, um, issues. We are uh, we have been uh, voting electronic voting since 2004, and uh, this voting was uh, allowed by uh, fingerprints, uh, fingerprint devices. And now uh, uh, this is going to be connected with the welfare database. This is a, a, a centralized welfare database in, in the country with people's uh, is information about whether people had pensions or they are receiving um, uh, public housing or they may be eligible for public employment or they are in the list for people who are able to get a scare foods for the government owned distribution networks or, or even medicines. Those two databases, the electoral one and the welfare database, have been connected and it was already tested in the recent mayor election in which they, they use the welfare information in order to put pressure in, in people, in voters, to vote for the government party, uh, and pretty much uh, eradicating the uh, secret of elections and uh, guarantee uh, success on their elections. Uh, about more than half the population, about 80% of the registered voters are in that database, so that is kind of guarantee uh, the government will continue in power forever since most of the population are going to be pressured by the need to get food and medicines in order yeah, and they were forced to be bought for the part the government party I think it's and also we have some time for questions thank you very much Iria. Uh, we should now uh, open up the open up the floor a bit more um, in deference to our um, online participants is there anyone uh, out in cyberspace who did not have the benefit to join us physically but would like to participate, please submit a question. Um, I also see Mr. Guy Berger from UNESCO has joined us. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, 
if you'd like to care to comment on anything you've heard, we'd be honored to hear from you, sir. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, some of these uh, 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 testimonies remind me of my youth. I come from apartheid South Africa where there was a hate speech law. It was used to prosecute, to prosecute people who criticized white domination. <laughs> uh, so that was probably a policy that was uh, developed with that particular intention. Uh, and I think this question of unintended effects uh, is particularly appropriate when policies come with good intention. And the question we need to look at is, is the road to hell paved with good intentions? I think that is part of the, the uh, uh, framing of this particular session. So I, I wanted to just contribute a perspective from UNESCO because I think this could be of value in trying to assess to what extent policies with good intentions can have unintended negative effects. And in our analysis, one of the reasons why you have these kinds of situations is, first of all, the problem of policy silos that, uh, you know, policies being made in one area not uh, taking into account other areas, which reflects the fragmentation in, in government uh, uh, governments vis vis internet reflects absence of multi-stakeholder practices in some places. And it's also because we know the internet covers so many things. Um, and it's the proverbial uh, elephant where people are feeling the one part of it and they think this is so important and they're passionate and it's their job to look after that one part, but they don't see the whole elephant. And so I, I, I would like to tell you how we got in our little UNESCO um, virtual helmet and we steered our, our drone to get a a view from on high of these issues. And we came up with quite a holistic perspective for the internet that I think is quite useful for trying to <coughs> see the interdependence of these different policy realms. And this is a, a concept uh, that we call internet universality. And it's very easy to, to work with because the acronym for what it means is R-O-A-M, to roam. Uh, so you could speak about the elephant uh, roaming along, <laughs> roaming free. Um, now, the, the ROAM is Rights, Openness, Accessibility, and Multi-Stakeholder. Rights, Openness, Accessibility, and Multi-Stakeholder Principles. And where this becomes very important is that I think what I've heard from people speaking a lot about the issues of rights. And we know that we have uh, historically well-established uh, guidelines in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights for how you, you balance rights when they are, you know, the right to security, right to expression, right to privacy, right to property, right to education. You always have to balance these. And uh, we know that uh, in international uh, jurisprudence, you should always balance with necessary, proportionate, legitimate purpose, you know, on a legal basis. Uh, it, sh it should be the least intrusive limitation possible and so on. They, these are, are very, very important and, and the cases where one can argue, was it done properly or not? Um, but I think the value of this ROAM model is that we're talking about balancing on the internet. So you actually have to bring in different considerations as well, because not just balancing rights as if we have proposed to balance them for, for up to uh, 70 years since the, the UDHR was declared. We have to figure out what is, when you're balancing rights, how does that impact on openness? So for example, uh, we know that there have been cases around the world of uh, governments deciding to block GitHub, okay? Well, if you block GitHub, you may have impacts on the openness of the internet because you're affecting uh, innovation, uh, knowledge transfer, technology transfer, and so on. We, we know, for example, that uh, many states do see themselves as protecting the vulnerable. Um, uh, we, we had some, some suggestions uh, coming out of these. If you don't, if, if you just speak about protecting the vulnerable, which of course is the right of the vulnerable people to be protected, and you don't look at accessibility, the, the A of the ROAM, I think you're missing a trick because part of accessibility is, is the internet a woman-friendly place? And if you, you have a setup in balancing rights which doesn't make the internet woman-friendly, well, it's not really accessible. The other thing about protecting vulnerable people is not just to have protection which they deserve from the state, but to help people protect themselves. Uh, particularly young people through media and information literacy. So that the point I'm making is that policies uh, balancing rights need to look at how do these translate? Uh, what's the impact? How do they implicate openness and accessibility? And the same way around, if you have policies on openness, 
uh, open data, open markets, how does that implicate rights? How does it implicate accessibility? And the same with, uh, with uh, accessibility, how does it implicate rights and openness? So it, I won't go into further detail, but I'd urge you to just have a kind of conceptual <coughs> philosophical perspective because we're speaking about the internet. The internet is a very fragile and very interdependent institution. And what happens in one sphere has these unintended effects in the other sphere. And therefore, good policy making should be holistic. And the M is multi-stakeholder, which is one way you can actually try and have holistic policies. And the last thing I want to say is that um, this is also obviously a very new world. So uh, one example that we've been looking at recently is this question of policies about radicalization for violent extremism. Now, if you're sitting in a society and you want to develop policies on this, you can do one of two things. You can say, we're going to block this content that's inciting people to become radicalized. Or you can say, we leave it there, but we'll, have, we'll survey it so we can actually see who's really going to be you know, involved in some kind of terrorist activity. But you can't do both. Okay? You either block it <laughs> and you remove it, <laughs> or you leave it and you survey it. So, I mean, these are not compatible policy options. So how should those options be, be decided? Well, you need to have some evidence. <laughs> to what extent is the internet actually implicated in this, the content, because in many cases, the radicalization is taking place not so much on the internet, but in prisons, in places of worship, and so on. So maybe that's the wrong thing. And the other thing is that whichever you do, you have to have some evaluation as to what is the impact of, of that strategy. And so what we're doing, uh, to tie back to my last, uh, my, my, this ROAM, we're trying to develop indicators whereby in a society you could actually say, let's look at the balancing of rights um, and get evidence as to how the balancing is working uh, and also vis-a-vis -vis the OAM so that you could make an assessment and say, well, actually society X can do better in terms of balancing, can do better in terms of openness, can do better in terms of accessibility and multi-stakeholder practice. And you can use this heuristic with evidence because now you do a mapping with indicators for this model. So uh, uh, that's all I have to say for now. And I have to give apologies because I'm going to a session uh, which is exactly on developing indicators for this ROAM, ROAM model. And if you want to uh, find out more about it, it's of course easily available on the internet. But I would really urge people we sometimes have to look up from the specifics and look at the more general principles. And I think these principles, ROAM, are really useful heuristics to begin to get interconnected policy frameworks that can avoid uh, the silos that lead to unintended effects. Guy, thank you very, very much. We know you're a busy man here, and we appreciate you taking the time to spend with us. Um, I think that notion of the blocking versus surveillance is, is resonates with me. I think obviously there's a sense of pick your poison. On one hand, you got to do one thing, you got to do another, and both are going to bring um, equal amounts of criticism. So thank you very much for bringing that to us. Um, now to the floor and or cyberspace. Um, I saw you first, ma'am, so please um, address any of our panelists or just a general question. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Emilia Givropoulou. I am a digital policy advisor for uh, the Green CEFA group in the European Parliament. And uh, I would like to thank you all for your uh, input. I'm really happy that we had uh, positions and uh, experiences from all over uh, the globe, not only Europe, but I'm also happy that we have someone from Europe because uh, I want to take the discussion to a maybe different topic that is actually affecting uh, the Internet uh, globally. So I would like uh, anyone's reaction or reflection on a current uh, policy discussion that is uh, ongoing in the European institutions on copyright reform. So in the copyright reform, we have two articles uh, that are very uh, um, troubling. So Article 11 is uh, opting for a um, uh, neighboring right for news publishers, uh, which uh, we, if not processed uh, in a good uh, way. It can even cover snippets and hyperlinks, and obviously this could lead to uh, major um, uh, effects on freedom of expression. And the second article is Article 13, which uh, imposes uh, 
upload filter obligations to platforms which can also effect, have effects on freedom of expression and censorship and this can have a global effect as well as you can understand platforms are not only in Europe so I would like uh, if someone from the panel uh, has something to say on that thank you anybody care to address that let, let me please Andre. Uh, First of all, I think that um, such kind of uh, provisions in legislation <clears throat> will negatively affect um, ecosystem of Internet. So it will require for some of actors, mainly for intermediaries, to install equipment which could be used not only in such cases, yes, but not only for protection of uh, copyrights or other rights online. Um, <clears throat> and um, it's, you know, from different jurisdictions and different legal regimes we are facing online. Uh, some repressive regimes probably will ask to use such facilities to limit political speech to limit uh, political expression. So <clears throat> that's why I think that initiatives like Microsoft Digital Geneva Convention uh, should be supported by internet businesses in a way that business should also uh, have responsibility for maintaining internet freedom and not allowing uh, governments to use uh, internet intermediaries as instruments or tools for um, suppressing freedom of expression online. So another point that um, the voice of uh, civil society in this case, I think um, lobby from uh, industries from Hollywood, from uh, other uh, copyright industries uh, should be um, balanced with interest of access to information and free uh, expression online. So reforms in the European Union, of course, will um, influence all internet community around the world. And for majority, uh, it will probably have negative effect. And probably it will um, restrict access to cultural uh, information, to heritage, to, to other kind of information. Uh, so um, I think that it should be a campaign against such provisions. and. Uh, you should uh, rely not only on European Union uh, NGOs, but also neighbors and uh, general civil society community around the world. Thank you, Andre. Yes, this gentleman straight ahead, please. Uh, uh, I am Rupinder Parhar from India. Uh, I just wanted to make a point. See, the basic problem today is uh, that the governments at times are making laws uh, 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 to govern the uh, freedom of speech and right to information. Uh, like typically in our country also uh, the uh, Information Act which was passed uh, was made. However, one of the state governments, after all there are all kinds of people, politicians, they used uh, provision of that act to arrest two people because they had posted some matter on the Facebook. And uh, at the first reading, it was not, nothing was wrong with it. No, I mean, I could, couldn't make anything apparently wrong. So uh, since they used that provision to arrest, uh, the, uh, the social uh, media became uh, alive. Uh, the Supreme Court of our country took uh, cognizance of it and struck down that act, uh, pr provisions of that particular act. So probably what is happening is that we need uh, to formulate uh, some kind of draft model laws uh, towards uh, right uh, freedom of speech and towards uh, 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 your uh, uh, other uh, associated things because 
what the gentleman said earlier about the internet is fragile to that extent. So we need to strengthen it and suppose laws, especially now since we are functioning under the, in the IGF under the UN, some draft model laws could be circulated around to the countries which would help the lawmakers uh, at least get options as to what model law should be all about. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, there are a number of um, international NGOs involved in that, but I, but I agree that, that they need to be more and more widely circulated. Is there anyone else who would like to comment on that here? Or um, if not, Marta, I'll, I'll call on Marta. Okay. Okay. Oh, you should turn your microphone on. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, well, you know, in in Latin America, we we look very uh, with a lot of apprehension from the civil civil society that kind of regulations, because I was hearing the guy of UNESCO to talk about uh, uh, bad consequences of good intentions, but in many cases in our countries there are bad intentions, so. <laughs> Uh, the, the, so Absolutely when, when true, Martha. In, in the in the case of Ecuador, we have uh, our co our government has already used DMCA laws, the American DMCA law, to take down content that was legitimate content because they copyrighted every logo of public documents. So you cannot publish a public document because you were infringing copyright law. They copyrighted the face of the ex-president Correa, Sujo. You, should, you could not put any kind of video with the face of the president. And I, I was thinking about the Zimbabwe case, because when you say, oh, maybe in the cases when there is a, a, a threat to the government, but when putting the price of bread is considered a threat, you have to, to, to be very aware of the things that you are allowing. In Ecuador, we didn't have a war but we have a work-like scenario. When the government perceived any oppositor, any people who criticized them as an enemy, so you were a threat to the state. I was a threat to the state. So everyone, every journalist, activist, environmentalist was a threat to the state. <coughs> so uh, regarding to that aspect, the thing is that some things maybe uh, make sense or, or seems to make sense in Europe, but they validate the repression saying things like, you know, the European Union is doing that. In Ecuador, we had a privacy law that didn't protect citizens, but the uh, bureaucrats. So our emails could be published by the government we have extensive uh, databases merged by the government with our credit card information and health information and all that stuff. But you could not publish any kind of information about the bureaucrats, about the authorities, because that was uh, viol that, that means you were bi violating their, pri their privacy. So they had privacy, the citizens didn't. So I, 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 I want you please to be very cautious with that because that has really unintended consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. And just to uh, um, embarrass you a bit, I just want to thank you not only for that, but being such a big fan of classic pop and rock. <laughs> Marta has a great singing voice, but we won't ask her to perform for us today. <laughs> This gentleman here, I promised a um, question or statement, please. Thank you. My name is Bertrand Moulier. I represent the International Federation of Film Producers Associations. My point is obviously, and making allowance for what you just said, of course, that uh, the European model for copyright protection is not necessarily universal. However, the two articles referenced by the, the uh, person behind me who asked the question or raised the issue of the draft new copyright directive, articles 11 and 13, which you reference, it would be one-sided to characterize them as having direct linked with uh, um, curtailment of freedom of exception. We, all of us creators of films or any kind of other creative content, when the news publishing take, 
take objection to this. We actually, all of us, fight extremely hard to guarantee and uphold freedom of expression in what we do. These articles are, in fact, designed to redress the playing field, you could argue. I'm not a news publisher, so I can't argue on their behalf. But why does it seem so unreasonable that they should be asked for cert certain rights to guarantee that they can make a living out of the uh, iteration of their content through the internet? Uh, even more so with Article 13, and again, I'm not uh, arguing for everyone, but these big hosting sites uh, have a responsibility to the content creators and uh, to ensure that they can share in whatever returns from the uh, enjoyment of their videos, for instance, on these, on these platforms. Um, by <laughs> arguing for our livelihoods, ladies and gentlemen, we are arguing for forming part of the edifice of freedom of expression. If you don't have authors of viable companies that make films or other forms of content that participating in the democratic uh, buoyancy, then you have a very big missing link. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else who would like to join in or have a comment? I saw your hand up first I, in, in your second. Sir, please. Uh, my name is Bobby Bailey. I'm a content creator from India. Uh, it's very interesting that in the course of the last one hour, we have heard about freedom of speech, the use of free speech to terrorize. The, uh, we've heard about uh, how uh, copyright is important for the protection of uh, livelihoods. We've heard about how you can protect the copy, uh, you, you can actually damage the system by protecting the copyright of the faces of politicians or copyright, as we heard. So all I want to say is that this is a very, very complex task in front of us. And as a content creator, I think uh, my request to forums like the IGF is that find that fine balance so that we live in a safe area, but the content creator is uh, protected and he can earn a livelihood, engage and entertain audiences, and sustain the backbone of the internet, because I still believe very strongly that while the internet is the most important uh, invention of the last decade. It's definitely uh, a lot of its strength and backbone comes from the engaging and entertaining content and allows regulatory security and safety uh, issues to ride, uh, legislative issues to ride on it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I completely appreciate what you're saying as someone who listens to a lot of music uh, online for free. And so I do agree that those content providers provide a lot of joy and value to us in our society and they should be appropriately compensated. This gentleman here. Yeah. Thank you, Dominic. I'm Walid al Sakaf. Um, I'm speaking here in my capacity as an academic at Sadatarn University. Wow. I teach media and technology and this is really in the, uh, up my alley because I understand that the internet has facilitated many new forms of media technologies that are sometimes rather uh, growing rapidly, emerging in speed that we cannot really cope with. Among those that I would like to raise is the blockchain technology because uh, we are not giving it enough attention in the journalism field. And I feel that there's lots of potential of bringing in the subject of distributed networks on the uh, data layer, uh, meaning that we take the inherent characteristics of the internet, which is a distributed peer-to-peer -peer communication network, to the layer of data. So it will be peer-to-peer -peer data communication in the form of uh, storing data. So the uh, particular example of copyrighted content can actually be solved in many ways through a blockchain uh, structure, because it would mean that the central authorities, the intermediaries, will not be involved. It's from the consumer directly to the creator. And all of the uh, replicated data can be tracked. Who has been replicating data? Because genuine uh, created content can be hashed in a way that makes it unique. It's impossible to forge, in other words. So that's one area. Another area is the uh, censorship, uh, let's say, uh, proof method that w one can actually apply on a a database such as the distributed ledger because it makes it possible for you as a 
a journalist to publish your content in such a way that it's so distributed it's impossible for certain authorities to block it from being accessed. And that's another way that could be extremely helpful at times of humanitarian, um, let's say, conflict or times of internet shutdowns. So it's rather important for, the, for, the, for us to look into this. And I made uh, this note given that this is marked as a new technology uh, work um, session, <laughs> so it means uh, a lot. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who has a non-copyright a related issue? I mean, we can keep going, but I want to also bring in other voices and perspectives. Sir, young man here. Hi, my name is Rohan Deswani. I'm a secondary student. And one thing that comes to my mind when thinking about the dark side of internet policy is that there's this compromise or this sort of like opportunity cost between privacy and security and that once you get security, you lose out on privacy. So one question that I want to ask to the panel and everyone here is that what we should value or should there be a trade-off between the two or how you think that we should deal with this issue? Thank you. Thank you, young man. Your credit to your educational uh, institution and your family. Who on the, the panel would like to um, address this question, or anyone in the room. Mm. I actually see uh, on, on the side of people who uh, will take uh, uh, privacy uh, as a as a as a primacy instead of security. I think we are moving to a, 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 a society uh, which is controlled by fear. And they, that is uh, I enable governments, especially authoritarian governments, to pass forward restricted laws and to uh, allow more controls over society. And I will be uh, no question in favor of privacy. And uh, also, I really, really appreciate your question. I think it's one of the best questions uh, so far. Yes, please, Malika. Yeah, just to add, uh, uh, I think it's, it's a complex question that we can debate for many, many hours. Uh, and it also, the response varies from individual to individual, generation to generation, and culture to culture. Last week, uh, last week I was at a discussion <laughs> forum like this, uh, where a member of the audience said precisely that, that younger members uh, of most countries, the, the digital natives, are apparently willing to live more of their lives out in public, generally speaking, than the digital immigrants. Now, that's a sweeping generalization, yes, but so the norms and uh, limitations of what we regard as uh, privacy and the inviolable limits keep changing keep changing uh, from time to time and society to society. And that's part of the problem. How do we then have safeguards uh, when it's a highly variable phenomenon? Thank you. This woman wanted to follow up on yeah, the question. That, that is a great question. Uh, first of all, uh, go to any of the, media, the sessions on encryption. You'll hear a lot more of this debate. Uh, one of the difficult things about encryption is that it's essential to both privacy and security. So, so these things are no longer, the trade-off isn't what it used to be. And, and one of the things about the digital era is that the trade-offs that governments used to be able to make, it's harder for technical reasons to have the trade-off. And so there is all this end-to-end -end encryption and it is essential to our economies and, and to our security as well as challenging our security. So, so this is a big challenge to governance and there's no easy answer. I think this is a question that will be debated for many IGFs to come. Um, any other questions or commentary from the floor or from cyberspace? Jessica, of course, my dear friend from Freedom House, please. Hi, I just wanted to take this opportunity to um, highlight a very real case that we faced as part of our delegation. Um, oh, yeah and which exemplifies some of the challenges that some of our participants face in actually attending um, an event such as the IGF and participating in discussions on internet freedom. 
one of our delegations from uh, delegation members from Rwanda was actually stopped at the airport and detained, prevented from traveling to the IGF. Um, he's an independent journalist and uh, online editor for a website uh, that provides critical news in Rwanda, and um, he faces uh, charges of treason that could lead to 25 years in prison, so we are very concerned for him. Um, and I just wanted to add a thought for those who were actually not able to attend such discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. It's easy to forget sometimes we take for granted we can easily be here and have these discussions, but for um, other ones, it's, it's uh, a very dangerous uh, proposition, and we hope that that gentleman is getting the legal remedy he deserves. Irina from Kiev. I just wanted to um, add something about situation in Ukraine. So um, I think that the, the situation we have now that uh, after our president decided to block this Russian social networks and it was, uh, it didn't have, we didn't uh, like do anything to stop it because it was a new challenge for us. We uh, as Vitaly said, we didn't have um, like challenges according to internet freedom before because our politicians didn't pay attention to internet, only to TV. So, um, so what I think is the best way to, um, um, to do in Ukraine is to grow some um, you know, like people, experts, who will be uh, really experts on digital rights. Because we, are lack, we, we have like a lack of organization and of people who actually understand what digital rights mean, uh, because we didn't uh, have this problem before. So this is kind of idea for a counterpart, maybe, to do some kind of TOT for uh, Ukrainian people to, to grow, actually, people who could speak about it. Thank you. Um, our chief of party is sitting to the right of me uh, on the wall, and I'm sure he'd be happy to discuss with you training of trainers on digital security and other um, aspects of how you've uh, uh, recommended. Um, is there anyone else? I know we got about five minutes left. Um, does anyone have any other issues or questions and specifically focus on perhaps some of the countries we're talking about? Marta, please. One question for all the panelists. Uh, the, the, the problems that you face in your countries are like uh, national born co uh, problems because in Ecuador, like in, I think in Venezuela, when we have problems with troll centers, they are not just pertaining to Ecuador. I mean, Ukraine is the case. Sometimes you, we know that this is a regional thing. Um, we have we have a lot of uh, in Ecuador we have a lot of troll centers uh, Putin style troll centers so I want to know what is the case uh, well I, I'm not asking Ukraine I know you have it but to Venezuela and to 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 uh, Sri Lanka to Zimbabwe uh, how how do you perceive that is there other kinds of interventions in your countries um, I'd like to answer uh, the panel is called dark side of internet. This is like uh, the situation with trolls like is called like uh, great uh, side of internet because it's uh, under researched. Uh, we like don't know much about how it functions, especially like how boss like function. Uh, but still uh, uh, we are on initial stage of researching and understanding that um, internet is first of all business. And business suggests you the best options to operate. That's why um, everyone who wants to manipulate, uh, they see that they, through, through the business tools, they can implement their practices. So like internet can be always used for good and for bad. Uh, and uh, since we have like regulations of, self-regulations of Facebook, of Google, um, uh, we might uh, we, we might have partners like to fight trolls and, and, and bots. Um, but generally, uh, the, the trend for Ukraine is that, uh, especially uh, on the upcoming elections, the technologies of using uh, artificial intelligence, bots, trolls, uh, will be rising. Uh, it will be used more and more. Uh, and 
uh, the programs of media literacy, of research, how to use like critical thinking, uh, 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 it will be more and more important. Uh, and this is the role, first of all, uh, of uh, civil society. Uh, because I don't believe that government uh, can regulate, because sometimes government is interested in the promoting, because uh, they all, like government usually want to hear uh, not all the critics in uh, social media and internet, which is usually uh, uh, users do, but um, some good feedback. And uh, the good uh, feedback for government is usually uh, done by trolls and bots. Yeah, I mean, definitely there are regional trends and patterns. I think we have some friends from Pakistan here who can probably support this point that, so when we talk about t violence against women online, one of the reasons why keep, we keep saying we don't, need no, we don't need new laws, but we want the existing laws to be implemented properly is because, for an example, in Pakistan, I know a cybercrime law was introduced with this framing it as like you know to protect women from violence online and up to date like it has not been applied for this purpose but it has been used to persecute bloggers uh, again and again um, and then even when it comes to e-governance and around uh, electronic national identification and the kind of uh, surveillance and the data collection that can happen from that we have very definite regional trends happening so India introduced this the scheme called Aadhaar and uh, we in Sri Lanka now we are trying to introduce a model that is based partly on that, partly on Pakistan. So some of these patterns we see them coming, and then especially in relation to e-governance, um, I think one of the biggest differences we see in the global north and the south is that in the north we see people trying to opt out of these systems, whereas in the global south we are grappling with the fact that there are major privacy issues, there is no data protection, all of those are there but at the same time if people want to access services you want to want to be counted in these systems so uh, definitely there are regional trends and I think one of the things we really need is to strate strategize in these regional and sub-regional levels as well because you can clearly see some of these trends thanks uh, I want to add something okay. uh, uh, certainly we see um, trends uh, interregional trends on the use of bugs and trolls. Uh, in the, this year, 2017 uh, elections in Ecuador, I was able to uh, confirm the flows of information using bugs and trolls from Venezuela to attack the opposition candidate, uh, Guillermo Lasso. And also, I was able to confirm uh, similar methods attacking the government candidate, Lenin Moreno, from Argentina. So it was a kind of, uh, kind of blocked of allies uh, using the their own box and trolls to intervene in a, a, another country election. Uh, we, uh, we also uh, we see this similar pattern of uh, Venezuela bo Venezuelan based bots and troll intervening in the debate about Catalonia referendum. So we are expecting next year for Brazil elections we can see these similar patterns of box from Venezuela intervening in that debate too. So I'll just add that moral panic is never a good basis for policy making or regulation. And in our countries, both governments and sections of civil society engage in that pressing the moral panic button. How do we counter? Power of regional and international networks who can tell us good practices and bad practices and so we can quickly formulate our positions for advocacy. Okay, thank you. Yeah, maybe talking of uh, Zimbabwe, obviously there is uh, Southern Africa, but uh, what I want to mention is that uh, we have a kind of different uh, regional context, in fact, the country context to be precise. When you look at the socio economic and political context, they are different. And uh, for that reason, and in line with our topic here, uh, good intentions that uh, turn out to be uh, dangerous. We are saying that laws or policies should not just be formulated uh, on a simplistic global perspective, but they should be formulated uh, from the point of view 
of the context of a particular society to say that uh, what applies to South Africa it does not apply to Zimbabwe. And the indicators of good policies should actually consider the manner in which the policies are formulated, whether the policies uh, uh, include the citizen input, whether the policies actually address pressing concerns within a particular society, not to just uh, talk of uh, cyber security in the context of uh, simplistic uh, global trends, but in terms of uh, trends that are applicable to a specific society. I'm told by my producer that it's t uh, time to wrap here. Um, if anybody ha um, has anything final for the good of the order, please speak now and very quickly. Um, otherwise, oh, quite forever. We, we, will, we will call this session to close, and we hereby declare it over. And thank you very much for joining us today.